Hey everyone, it's John Wheatcroft here again, bringing you another Sunday Q&A. This week we're up to number 48. I'm going to be recording the examples spread out over the week, so that might explain why I'm going to be wearing different t-shirts and I'm going to have different guitars in my hand. Uh, the reason for this, I'm very pleased to say, is that on Sunday afternoon I've got another gig. The second of the year in front of a real audience. So playing bass with the amazing Manoush Tones with Mickey and Carl. So I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, earlier on in the week, I did a performance, an online performance at Elliot Henshaw's place up in London. So the clip, the musical performance this week is going to be a clip from that uh, entire thing, which you can find on Elliot's site. So that features Elliot on drums. He's incredible. And uh, the equally incredible Andrew McKinney on bass. So it was a real thrill to get to play with those guys. And it's just great that things seem to be starting to happen again. So the fact that I'm using a different guitar on every clip kind of highlights one of the questions this week from Robin, asking about the specifics of gear uh, in terms of you know what type of strings, picks, um, and then some of the other uh, hardware stuff, hardware options that we've got for guitar. Do you use modeling? Or real amps or do you do it in the box you know via logic and so on and so forth and the short answer to that is I do everything I do all of those things they each have a place and they all have a really really solid musical application so we're going to be looking into that we're going to be looking into some two-handed tapping techniques so a little bit different from all the usual jazz stuff this is going to be more rock or maybe even fusion orientated and a slightly different way of seeing the pentatonic scale and I'm also going to make a little brief introduction into some physical warm-up ideas. Uh, until that, here's the music. I hope you enjoy the music. And I'll see you on the other side with the questions.
I had a request from David to look into some physical warm-up techniques. So what I've decided to do is to just do a very short example over the next few weeks, one each week, because there's thousands of potential options here, and I'm sure that you've already got a healthy collection of ideas that you can use yourself. Hopefully I might just be able to add some, uh, some just different ideas here. The thing with warm-ups I've found is that they need to remain to be challenging, they need to be varied as well, or if you're just going through the motions, they don't seem to have the same effect. The first point, I guess, is for me, generally speaking, I don't really often do too many just digital finger pattern warm-ups that have got no real musical application. I find that I've got enough musical things to do, that it's easy to find a small segment from a musical piece and use that as a physical warm-up, maybe a small section from a, a larger work, one or two bars from a tricky you know, part of a, a, a lick or a head of a tune or what, whatever it might be. Or it might just be playing a piece of music but doing it at reduced intensity and reduced tempo and so on. Okay, that said and done, uh, occasionally you can't hear yourself, you're at a gig and there's another band on or there's a blasting DJ or you're in a busy dressing room and people are talking to you. You can't really concentrate on actual music. You're playing an electric guitar. You can't hear it and so on. So in that instance, then physical you know, digital patterns can often be quite useful. So we'll, we will look at some of those. Although today I'm going to give you uh, a little bit of a warm up that's more of a kind of a cognitive skill. This is more about thinking about the guitar and playing at speed. Although, of course, we do have some coordination issues. We have some guitar geography issues to concern ourselves with. And it's to do with playing every note on every string through a specific cycle. So I'm gonna set my metronome to 60 beats per minute. Okay, I'm gonna start on the note of E and I'm gonna play an E note on every string. Now in this instance, I'm gonna, I've just decided the rules of the game are from, from the bass to the treble. I could do it the other way around or mix it up, do whichever you wish. So I'm gonna go from bass to treble, play all the E's. And then once I've done that, immediately without stop, I'm gonna move up a fourth and then repeat the procedure from a fourth away, which gives us the note of A. So that's gonna give us this. E, E. Then all the A's. D's. G. Next one's C. is next. E flat. A flat. D flat or C sharp. F sharp. That's every note on every string. Didn't take very long. Maybe two minutes, perhaps. I'm sure you can do the maths on that. Something, this is an exercise that I've been adopting on the upright bass, just by way as a matter of rote. Before I play anything, I go through the cycle, play every note on every string. I'm trying to do this in such a way that I can do it without thinking, that I can just immediately go E, 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 A, 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 A. I might even go around the cycle of fifths. I'll go the opposite way. So I'll start on E, then go to B, and go to F sharp and so on. Anyway, to just keep it mixed up, you could go through a major triad, find the E's, find the G sharps, find the B's. Okay, then you go from B, find the B, find the D sharps, find the F sharps, then go from F sharp or G flat, G flat, B flat, D flat, and so on. Whichever uh, way you can go around the clock, it's all valid. And in fact, if you mix it up, all the better because then you don't get into uh, kinesthetic memory where you're just playing finger moves and you don't necessarily know what you're doing. Another thing you can do on guitar is you can calculate how many frets you have. In this case, I've got 22. So I could go from the 22nd fret all the way back to the 10th. And then I have one version of every note at least between these two 
um, borders, as it were. And that's going to get you into the idea of uh, using uh, the notes in the higher register. In this instance, when I demonstrated the example, I stayed between the octave, uh, the open strings and the octave at the 12th fret, and I found each note between those two points, but I could just as easily have done it between the 10th fret and the 22nd. Or alternatively, where possible, you can play each note twice. You know, if for example, it's an E note, I've got an E here and I have an E here. And you can do that with your click. And so on and so forth, where it's possible. So the only instance of the notes that you're only gonna find in one location on a 22 fret guitar would be anything that you would normally find on the 11th fret. So that would be like the 23rd. I suppose you could reflect that by going on E flat and then bending the D up a semitonal. Or maybe in that instance, to keep it in time so that it's always the same meter on each note, you might play the 11th fret one twice, you know, go E flat or whatever and play it twice. Um, because what you get at the 12th fret is of course the open string. So that's a really simple exercise. But it keeps your brain working, you know, and warm-ups is not just about physical um, motion. It's also about being uh, sharp and paying attention, staying in the moment. What I particularly like about this exercise and exercises of a similar nature is you have to be doing one task whilst thinking of the next one. So as I'm playing my E's, I'm thinking what's a fourth away from me? And it's an A, so I already think of that and I'm ready to go immediately to the A. And I'm thinking already now, I already know it's D and I know the next one's G already. Because I'm thinking that far ahead, that's G and so on. Okay. Now there is another uh, variation on this very same exercise where we can repeat the exercise, but not without uh, actual playing, by going to ourselves, open, seventh, second, ninth, fifth, open. So that's the location of all the E notes. So that's doing that without even looking at the guitar. Hopefully you may have noticed I sort of stared off into the distance there. So I wasn't cheating by looking at the guitar. I know that E is the open string, it's the 12th fret. It's the seventh fret on the next string, second fret, ninth fret, fifth fret, open string. So you can practice this away from the instrument, walking down the street, where are all the E's on the guitar? Okay, then the next one goes to A, where are the A's? It's the fifth fret, it's the open string, seventh fret, second fret, 10th fret, fifth fret. You'll notice just being around other musicians that you see a certain amount of this playing the instrument in the air. You know, saxophone players that I hang around with, you know, when they're trying to work something out in their head when they don't have a saxophone, they'll run through the fingerings, you know. Guitar players will run through the fingerings, piano players run through the fingerings, trumpet players will run through the fingerings because they've got a connection between the sound and a physical location in space. So with this in mind, it's useful to run that exercise that we've just run but without the guitar. Now, that might start off pretty easy with E's and A's and D's and that's one of the reasons why you might think, why in this exercise did he not start with C given that almost every musical exercise starts with C? Yeah? Well, the reason why I started with E is because A, it follows the guitar, uh, so E follows the way the guitar is tuned. So we get a good run at it that we're super familiar with, E, A, D, G. Well, we should know that without even thinking now. And also it means that we don't hit the flats or sharps for quite a while. If we start on C, we only get two steps in and we're into the flat keys. So maybe E is a good way to, uh, to kind of ease yourself into this exercise. Now, of course, if this is something that you, you feel comfortable with, jump in at C, jump in at F. If you're interested in playing a lot of jazz ideas, then you want to get really accustomed to flat keys. You might want to begin every exercise from F. And that way you're going to be dealing with Fs and B flats and E flats and A flats and D flats pretty early on in the set of key changes. I had a great question from Robin relating to some of the equipment that I use. Uh, even going so far as to outline what type of picks, um, maybe even strings, and then also what uh, hardware, what uh, kind of uh, approaches I might use to capture an electric guitar sound. Uh, so I was gonna go into just some of uh, my equipment choices. Uh, I always found it funny when guitar players, sometimes we play down the, uh, the importance of gear. Uh, I was always really interested in what my favorite players uh, use or, or, or used to get the sounds that they get and also how they set their equipment um, 
it's always helpful to see if uh, if you're doing something that is uh, similar to your favorite players. You know, th- there's usually a good reason why players would go for a certain uh, equipment choice or go for a certain uh, setting or, or what have you. So I'm going to outline just a couple of the things that, that I use uh, because the, there is some differences to the equipment that I use depending upon which guitar I'm playing at any given time. So when I play electric guitar, so first off we do a picks. When I play electric guitar, for the most part, it's uh, a purple Dunlop Tortex, these things. I use these. And there's two reasons why. Uh, one is I think they sound good. That's the first one. And second, probably the main reason why, is that because of the material they're made out of, I find they don't slip, particularly when uh, you're on stage and things are getting a little bit hot. Um, I find if I play with a regular plastic pick, of which I have many, uh, even really super posh ones like blue chip picks and whatnot, or... Uh, nylon, uh, again Jim Dunlop, nylon pick with the serrated backing on it. I find I'm okay with those things at home, but as soon as I play live, I feel as if uh, I don't have that same purchase on the pick, that same kind of uh, level of grip on the pick, which is a really important thing if you want to keep your picking hand relaxed. I find if the pick is smooth and shiny, say, made of plastic or whatever, they often can sound great, but I find I have problems in the fact that they move in the hand, uh, they, they start to slip in the hand, so I over tighten the grip to keep the pick in one spot, and that negatively impacts upon my technique. So I find these are perfect in terms of, uh, you could stick to them pretty pretty well. Uh, so a couple of uh, provisos with this, I generally use the pointy end of the pick for more articulate things, uh, but if I'm playing styles of music, um, we don't need a warmer sound, like if I'm trying to emulate Wes Montgomery's thumb technique, but with a plectrum, so that I can play things uh, where you have this superhuman fast thumb technique, which I do with a pick. And also for certain tremolo picking things, and for things that are more like gypsy jazz, those kind of things, I'll flip the pick round and use the rounded end. So I'll use the, the pointed part for more articulate things, and then I'll use the rounded end for things where I want the pick to glide across the strings and also when I want a kind of a smoother, bassier sound. Okay, so some other uh, hopefully helpful points are I generally don't play with the pick square onto the string. It's usually on a slight angle or a more pronounced angle if I want more bite. So the pick is going to move between, I'd say very rarely is it square on, if ever, almost never, I don't think. Uh, to a slight angle at times, and then at other times a really pronounced angle, so that it slices ac- across the string. Again, same deal with, if I use the the, uh, the the rear shoulder of the pick, same deal, it's always angled. I might move it to different points along the uh, thumb as well, depending upon the type of sound I'm after, and how much of the pick I want to show to the string. Okay, And then the other one is, there's very often a slight lean in towards the guitar. So that instead of the pick being backwards and the string being pushed kind of across, I lean in slightly and the pick goes into the guitar very slightly, kind of like a rest stroke. Hopefully that's the first type of pick dealt with, the uh, the purple Jim Dunlop. The second one that I use frequently is the slightly heavier, I think it's called Gator Grip, I think they're called, uh, black Jim Dunlop pick. And that's two millimeters. The first one is 1.14, I think. Yeah, 1.14. Okay, and this is two millimeters, a little bit wider, uh, although it does go to a kind of almost like a point on the edge. And I use these on arch top jazz guitar when I play the Benedetto guitar and on regular acoustic guitars. Sometimes on gypsy jazz guitars, but we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, although I use the rounded part very often. If I'm playing more bop type ideas, it's the pointy bit. If I'm playing things that I want to sound like Django, I use the rounded edge and I kind of flip between the two, mid lick even. Okay, So I use these things on acoustic guitar. They generally give a slightly bigger sound, but they're a little bit rounder sounding. Uh, But I find that the slightly lighter picks are better for things like if I want to play with uh, muted notes or pinched harmonics and things like that, which I really, if ever do, on acoustic guitar and would never do on the jazz guitar. So with this in mind, I'm after a rounder and bigger sound. So that's 
that does that for me on the jazz guitar. So I switch between the purple ones for electric guitar and the black ones for acoustic guitars. With the exception of when I'm playing gypsy jazz on a Selma style Macaferries, in which case I've got a small collection of these fellas, which are made by Kill Killy Nonis. They're absolutely amazing. Uh, I think there's a name for this pick. I'm not sure what it is anyway, but, but he makes these by hand. Um, and what's great about them is they have different um, edges, if you like, so you can use the pointy part, the, you know, the conventional way, as it were. And I use that for the most part, but for certain rhythm approaches, I'll use the other shoulders, uh, which is really, really cool. Uh, you can get different tones. Once again, as well, he's got the Selma tailpiece kind of indentation and, and this material on the back. I'm not entirely sure what it is but that helps the grip which is a really really important thing i find with my technique the way that i play i want this pick in hand to be as loose as i can get it right any kind of tension is just going to mess things up for me terribly so the looser that i can make the pick in hand the better right so the looser it can be which means i can't really have an immensely tight grip on the pick there needs to be some friction going between the pick and my hand in which case then that can stay relaxed i've, I've spoken many times before about this thing that I like to do when I'm feeling tension and just take the thumb off the back of the pick and it's helpful if the pick stays where it is. So I use that for gypsy jazz guitars. It's much thicker. It's probably double the thickness of the purple pick, maybe even more. I'm guessing it's three mil perhaps. But it's got a beveled edge, so it's a left-handed pick. I don't know. Probably sounds kind of ridiculous, but it's purpose-made left-handed pick because if I angle the pick like so, then a right-handed player the angle needs to be the opposite direction. Unless you're like uh, Robin Nolan or players like so, who angle the pick kind of uh, like a reverse um, uh, 45, whereas if I'm, I go this way, Robin holds the pick that way, so kind of a reverse angle to the guitar, slices across, across the strings that way, and it sounds great, he makes it really work. But Robin has to buy left-handed versions of the picks, even though he's a right-handed player. So if you are a player that plays with the bevel going this way, or if you, who plays um, with the pick angle this way, and you were gonna get one of these beveled picks, which uh, some of the uh, bespoke pick makers make them beveled, then uh, you'd need to get the reverse left-handed bevel. Now, that said and done, on electric guitar, I really like, I love the, the sound that you get and the feel that you get when you use picks that have got no bevel at all. So what happens is over a period of time, you begin to wear the pick down. Now, what I do when I'm playing electric guitar is if I'm practicing, I'll just wear these things down until there's there's nothing left of them. But when I play, uh, I've always, it's like uh, playing with a new tennis ball or something or a new cricket ball or what have you, right? If I'm gonna play live, it's always with a new pick always with a new pick. I'd change the mid gig if, if you know, if, if I feel like as if the the uh, the leading edge is wearing down, because I like that tension, that the, the, uh, the slight resistance you get as it's biting into the string. So that, um, that makes a big difference when things like, if I'm recording or if I'm performing, and even for things like when I've played electric guitar on the Q&A sessions, I'll use a new pick, you know, I'll make certain that it's a new pick. It makes a massive difference to the way it feels for me because I find that I only use the very, very edge of the pick. Uh, it's less prevalent, actually, if I'm playing with the the, uh, the rounded edge. They, they very rarely wear down, to be fair, so that's not really a problem. It's more this pointed part. So I'll switch to a new pick anytime I'm in a performance situation. As I say, practice is a, is a different thing. Practice rather like changing strings, if for practice purposes, I just leave them on, you know, just to mix it and I keep them clean, but I'll leave them on the guitar for as long as I can get away with. And then when I perform, it's new strings. Usually, not necessarily every gig, because the, I might be doing multiple gigs in a, in a run, but usually I'll change them for every run. So if I had a weekend with three or four gigs in a row, I might maybe chance every gig with the same set of strings, uh, depending upon whether or not I'm taking a spare guitar and then change them for the next uh, for the next gig. Of course, during lockdown, there hasn't been much in the way of gigs, so uh, I haven't really been going through strings that often, but you know, I still have to uh, uh, keep on top of things because you know, for the recording and so on. So I hope uh, that's of some use. They're the picks that I choose and the reasons why I do it. 
Whilst we're on the topic of picks and bits of gear, um, strings are 11 to, in this instance, 11 to 49, I think. The um, purple any Balls, uh, 335's got 11 to 50 something, 52, 54. I always know the first number, I don't know the end number. They're slightly heavier. So these are like basically slightly heavier than a set of 10s. 35's a little bit heavier. Uh, I think all Telecasters have got 10 to whatever 10s go to, and all Strats have got 11 to 49. So for the most part, 11 to 49 is the kind of, uh, or 48, I think, whatever those early ball uh, purple strings are. For the most part, that's like the default string set. The 335's a bit heavier, and the Telecaster's a little bit lighter. The action's a bit higher on the Tele. Uh, on the Selma style Macaferries, I switch between 10s or 11s based upon how the guitars are feeling. Uh, I know it sounds strange, but if anyone who plays those Selma guitars will know exactly what I mean, they move around quite a bit from uh, season to season. Uh, and also with the bridges being non-adjustable, other than shimming, you have to get used to shimming the bridge. You know, I've got lots of little pieces of ebony that I use to shim the bridge as the uh, guitars move about. And sometimes they just feel great with 10s, other times they feel great with 11s. So that's really light for an acoustic guitar, but they are uh, longer scale length than a regular acoustic guitar, I believe. Uh, and 11s about the heaviest strings you can even buy. Uh, I think at one point I tried to put a set of acoustic guitar strings on the guitar and nearly broke the top nut off. Uh, they wouldn't fit, you know, they wouldn't fit. And uh, it was so tense, and it just didn't sound good and didn't play well. So those strings for that guitar are a little bit unusual. I think they've got like silk and steel kind of combination as well. So they, they feel looser, they feel lighter, but the action's generally a little bit on that, slightly on the higher side. Okay, so in terms of uh, other bits of equipment, Robin was asking about um, amp modelers and things like that, you know, and whether or not they're uh, they're any good, you know. And of course, this is only my opinion, and I'm sure everyone will have their own opinion on these things. But I think they're really great, you know, and in in the right place, used in the right situation, uh, they're really really useful. So uh, in here in my little home studio, I use two different types of amp modelers. Sometimes I've got a um, a remote laptop recording rig that I use when I'm not at home. And for that, for the most part, I use Guitar Rig, uh, the Native Instruments, I think it is, NI Guitar Rig, I think number five. No doubt that's been superseded by now, but that's the one that I'm using, Guitar Rig 5. And that's really cool. Uh, in here, I'm using a Line 6 Helix, uh, Helix Stomp, the small one. It's about the size of two tube screamers, but it does everything. It's absolutely brilliant, wonderful. Um, yeah, it serves as many different things. It can serve as like an interface. You can use it uh, for amp modeling. You can use it for um, impulse responses, which I use for the upright bass and for the nylon string. It runs impulse responses, rather like uh, the Tone Dexter, which is something that I use when I play the Salma guitar. The difference being, I think the Tone Dexter, you can uh, make your own impulse responses pretty easily. I'm not so sure that you, well, you can't do that, I don't think, with the Helix, but you can certainly import them when you've uh, got them from some third party or what have you, and that's what I've done for the upright bass, because of course, my electric upright doesn't have a body, so I've used an impulse response from a bass that has a body, and that really improves the sound tremendously when you're going direct into uh, Logic or whatever you might use. Uh, now I also, for certain things, like the album that I'm in the process of recording, when I'm playing the arch top for the principal lead sound, I've got in uh, Studio 2, as we uh, as we might call it, or what is better known as the spare bedroom, uh, I have a matchless uh, SC30. I have that running in the uh, next room. And the reason why I've chosen that particular amp is I AB'd all my amps and I've got some fantastic amps. Um, yeah, some uh, amazing amps, one of which, which I absolutely adore, this DWJ amp, which sounds like a dumbbell which is unbelievable, which I use when I don't use any pedals. It's just the most amazing sounding amp, which hopefully I'm going to be using a lot more of. Now, the gigs are beginning to start, but obviously in lockdown, there hasn't been so much in the way of gigs. But the Matchless is great in the fact that it sounds really, really good when it's really quiet, and it's super quiet as well. It's the quietest of all the amps that I've got. Although I think Dan's amp is, is just as quiet, actually. Um, but the Matchless is set up there permanently. 
Well, it certainly has been throughout lockdown. Anyway, so anyone who stays in the spare room is going to have to stay with a couple of my amps, I'm afraid. Uh, and I, ha I run that um, with uh, two mics. I've got a, a Neumann. Uh, or do I use the Neumann? Yeah, I've got a Neumann in there that's close mic. And, uh, sorry, I've got an SO57 that's close mic and then a Neumann, whichever, large condenser mic that's a distance away, that's a couple of foot away from it. And I do that when it counts, you know, meaning for stuff on my own album, things where I really want an amp sound, I'm going to use that and maybe it maybe even put some pedals in front of it if need be. Although for my album, it's just a clean, straight jazz guitar sound and it seems to work really, really well. It seems a bit, little bit bigger and a touch more real than uh, than the, uh, the Helix. But the Helix is still great, you know. But for every guitar magazine that I've ever done, pretty much every single one of them, and I've done hundreds of them, I've used amp modelers. So I've used either guitar rig, I think maybe at the start I might have even used a pod, Line 6 pod, and they're great. I've still got one of those somewhere, kidney shaped, kidney bean shaped thing, you know. Uh, I can't bring myself to get rid of it, even though I, I don't know when I'm going to use it again or whatever now that I've got the Helix. So, uh, And I use, I had used the Helix or Guitar Rig, and they're just great. It's just the fact that they're so convenient. You can go A, B in a whole bunch of different amps and whatnot. Um, and it's great when you're trying to kind of emulate other players' sounds. They're just so editable and, and they work really well. And I love them. I think they've definitely got a place. Uh, playing live, it's not really something that I've used. I, I'm not in any uh, rush to get rid of my amps because I think nice valve amps with a pedal in front, you know, just a couple of pedals in front. It's just the sound of every album I've ever heard, you know, or, you know, it's, it's what I've been used to all my life. So that for me is is very much my go-to for playing live. And then also some stuff uh, where, generally speaking, if it's gonna be an album session, something that, that um, uh, where I'm really concerned about you know, multiple listens and things like that, then I'm probably gonna use a real amp for the most part. Although I did a thing recently with uh, Elliot Henshaw, the two tracks, uh, well, more than two tracks, but two that I'm particularly proud of, one of which I used Dan's amp, which sounds incredible. Uh, and then another track that we recorded, we did a version of a, of a Brecker Brothers tune, and I recorded that downstairs on a laptop with guitar rig through a really super cheap Line 6 USB uh, interface, which cost less than 100 quid, I think. And the guitar sounds fantastic. I think it might have been this guitar or 335, and this guitar sounds great through anything. So I think, you know, all of these things have got their place, and I use them all. It's like, you know, saying uh, separate pedals as opposed to modelers. Well, I think there's a time and a place for both. You know, I really love the idea of not using anything though. And there's, there's one gig in particular that I, I use just Dan's amp and control the overdrive via the guitar volume. And it's just so liberating not having any pedals on the floor, which is great. But then there's other jobs where it just needs sounds. I need to have access to various sounds. So that's not gonna, in that situation, going to work so I mean of course I can just use that amp then as a as a pedal base as it were and put pedals through it and that sounds brilliant for that you know, so in a way I'm in a privileged position that I've got lots of different solutions for different problems and with that in mind I'll hopefully choose the right amp or the right combination for whatever I'm doing the other thing that I've got as well I've got this micro rig which is just the smallest thing possible that I use just for when um, going to gigs on the underground or what have you, you know. So there's certain, uh, particularly London, where I don't really cherish the opportunity to drive if I can help it, where I use a little Henriksen Bud. It's like eight inch speaker, so, so small, but ridiculously powerfully packed and, and it's loud and pokey and it sounds really great. And you use that with a few pedals. If it's more of a jazz thing, then maybe I might not use pedals and there's a horn, switchable horn that you can kick in and out. And that sounds really nice with uh, the arch top. If you turn the horn off and you put some pedals in front of it, it sounds great with electric guitar. So some of that is just based upon convenience. And as well with that, sometimes I use that with the Helix um, and leave the horn on, but use amp modelers. Just when you need to get some sounds together and you need to travel immensely light and it's a workable, even for things like rehearsals and so on. It, and you can get it on the underground. You know, you can put a gig bag on your back, um, the amp on a trolley and it's you're good to go you know it's not a real hassle to uh, to carry around that said and done as i say i'm in no rush to get rid of my valve amps because they just sound so amazing you know so if i had to use the matchless or dan's amp it's just incredible it's such such a kind of 
a big sound. And some of it maybe is not even about the sound. Some of it's about the way it feels. Like I find uh, using you know, moderately, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Moderately powered valve combo um, where the sound is emanating from all places. It's coming out the back, it's coming out the top, all that kind of stuff. It just makes, the, makes it feel like you're kind of enveloped in sound. And it makes you play better. You know, there's no two ways about it. You definitely play better. So all of these solutions have got a place. For the Q and A's, uh, I wanted to just do something that was really, really easy. So all of these sessions I've used, I think every one of them, yeah, from playing electric guitar or acoustic even. When I've been playing the nylon string, I've been using an impulse response to give me a bit of reverb, okay, through the Helix. Just coming out of my at least this monitors, going into a, a USB mic. I haven't done anything in the way of trying to get any kind of a fancy sound here because I wanted it to be immediate. The whole point of this is it's not meant to be an album track. It's meant to be just me in the office room running through stuff, you know, pretty much in uh, as immediate and an almost real-time way as I could make it so that it was more informal and, and less kind of polished and prepared. And I didn't necessarily want the performances to sound like as if I was trying to make them sound like they were studio recordings. So with that in mind, all you're hearing is the sound coming through a USB mic, you know, for, uh, for better or worse, just so that I could have this, the immediacy of also being able to play, being able to talk, and just being able to edit things very, very quickly and easily. So that's what I've been using on the Q&A. So I hope that's uh, of some assistance. Oh, in terms of guitars, again, you know, I'm super privileged. Uh, I've got loads of guitars. Um, I don't necessarily buy that many guitars. There's this thing where people think that I'm constantly shopping for guitars. It's just that I'm good at buying them. I'm terrible at selling them. So if I think some of the guitars I've got, I've had for 20 years more, you know, and I just seem to just keep adding um, as I need a specific thing, partially but down to being left-handed, I think. So as I'm left-handed, if I need a particular guitar to do a specific job, then for the most part, I generally need to own it. It's not like if I had a session and I needed to, uh, I wanted to play a 12 string electric or something, I could borrow one of one of my friends, uh, as I'm sure they would lend me, but it's gonna be upside down for me. So with that in mind, as work has come in over the years and I've had a requirement, oh, I need a nice nylon string, I need a nice steel string acoustic guitar that I can play uh, you know, regular acoustic as opposed to uh, McAfee style guitars. Uh, I need a Selma style guitar. With that, I needed a backup as well. I definitely needed a backup guitar. Um, various different, you know, every guitar player needs a Strat. You know, every guitar player needs some kind of a Gibson. Okay, maybe it's an extravagant having a Les Paul and a 335, but I think there's a difference. There's definitely a difference. Uh, so over the years, I've amassed quite a collection of guitars, uh, but they all get used. You know, I would say pretty much every one of them has got its place and they all get used. That's my uh, excuse and I'm sticking to it. But as they say, the perfect guitar collection, how many guitars have you, you know, how many guitars do you need? And the answer to that is always one more. So uh, yeah, I'm sure by the next time um, that I, I do another one of these kind of effectively rig rundowns, there'll be some addition that I can talk to you guys about. But I hope for the moment that's been helpful. I had a great message from Harry asking me to look at some of the more rock orientated techniques that I use. So by way of a bit of a different topic here, we're gonna look at some two-handed tapping based around the C minor pentatonic scale. I'm gonna give you two different ideas. But first off, let's make sure we know what we mean when we talk about the C minor pentatonic scale. Okay, it's a five note pattern per octave. I'm sure at this stage, you're familiar with this group of notes. Root, minor third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, flat seven, and octave. Now, as we're dealing with a rock technique here, we're gonna use a moderately high gain sound. So, generally speaking, it's very often configured two notes per string. And then the next octave. Okay, and there's five different patterns for this scale, as there's five potential start notes. So from C, from E flat, from F, from G, maybe we'll go down here, finally from B flat. Now these are fairly basic, uh, simple shapes, you can find them pretty much anywhere. So I won't waste time 
looking at the basic five shapes, I'm sure you either already know them or you can find them out pretty quickly. Well, now, what I'm going to um, suggest to you is that instead of seeing them as two notes a string, constituting a low and a high note on every string, we can see these pentatonic shapes in the form of one note per string as a straight line or otherwise that moves across the neck. So if I just consider now the lowest note of all, uh, I'll go from this particular shape we call the E shape. If I just consider the, the lowest note and only that one note, I end up with the first finger. I've got a complete straight line that moves across the neck, in this case of the eighth fret. Now if I consider the highest note, I've got, it's not a straight line, it's kind of a, a contour to the line that goes 11th fret, 10th, 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 11th and 11th. So now I've got these two straight lines, or two lines, straight or otherwise. And these lines are the lines that we can use when adding extra hammer-ons to select appropriate notes for the correct minor pentatonic scale, knowing with security that we're going to be playing notes that are within tonality. So, what happens is, whatever the highest note in one shape is, i.e. 11, 10, 10, 10, 11, 11, becomes the lowest wall, if you like, in the next shape along. So, here, in this shape, I'm playing all of those fretted notes with the third or fourth fingers. In the next shape, I play exactly the same notes, but now with the first and second fingers, allowing me to move to the next wall, which is now being played with the third and fourth, and on that goes. Let's map out our series of lines that move across the fretboard. So we have a straight line at the eighth fret. We have a line that folds in between the 11th and 10th. It goes 11, 10, 10, 10, 11, 11. We have a line that's almost straight, just nudges in on the G string at the 13th. We have a line that nudges out on the B string at the 15th. So 15, 15, 15, 15, 15 16. Then we have a line that goes back and then uh, starts straight, moves back and then goes back to where it begins. So 18, 18. Uh, 17, 17, 18, 18, and then an octave higher than where we began. So bear in mind again that those lines form the basis of the lower notes and the higher notes of each pentatonic pattern. So all we need to do to move from one pentatonic pattern to another is move what note we would have normally played with the third and fourth finger, with the first and second finger, and then we're in the next shape. So really, there's only these five shared walls, as, as it were. The low note of one shape is the high note of another. So for example, keep your eye on the eighth fret here. So that note's shared between the shape that's below and the shape that's above. Now, how this helps us with two-handed tapping, as opposed to where we use these shapes to create chords a little while ago, is that we then use these lines to trace out where the pentatonic notes might be in any of these pentatonic shapes. So if I hold down the E form with the fretboard hand and hammer that straight or otherwise line, knowing that it nudges out a fret on the B string, I know that that's always gonna be uh, within the tonality. Now, of course, I can choose one that's quite close. Well, I can choose one a little further away. One more time. Or even further away. Or super further away. It's pretty simple, yeah? You just follow the lines. Now, okay, there's two considerations here that I think you should really think about. One of them is how you're going to deal with muting. I tend to do this either with the palm of the hand, if it's just for one or two notes. If it's more than a fleeting few seconds, the pick folds into the index finger and I tend to lay the thumb on the bass strings. And then the underside of the unused fingers in this hand. And the second one is how are you, second consideration is how are you gonna get into these 200 ideas? You can't really just drop into them. So for my style of playing, maybe based on players like Eddie Van Halen, uh, it's usually one of two things. It's usually either some uh, 
combination of a trill, where if I do a trill, then that allows the, uh, the hand time to change posture, or more likely than not, more often than not, some form of a bend. So if I'm in this pentatonic shape and I go, that's gonna allow me time to get in. And then I'm in the, pa the posture that I need. I'm in the posture that I need to be in to allow myself to kind of make the transition to the two-handed kind of uh, addressing the neck in this area rather than being here. And then vice versa on the way out, the same thing. So if I do this a little bit slower, maybe I go. Let me slow things down just a little bit and give you some options in terms of moving this around. So we could keep the tap in one location, like for example, 20th fret say, and now I'm just gonna move around different pentatonic options. I just moved to different pentatonic options there with the fretboard hand whilst the tap uh, stayed in one location. Of course, we can do the opposite. The tap could move around whilst the fretboard hand um, stays where it is. Or we can play any one of the five shapes. So, for example, I'll move two away. So, say I'll just run this as an exercise and I'll do a little triplety pattern. I could do the E form in the fretboard hand whilst tapping at the 15th fret. goes okay then I can move up to the next pentatonic form okay making sense and then hopefully the same thing here of course taking in all the strings now now the problem with this of course is that you need to take two different pentatonic shapes into account when playing the same scale you have to be thinking about both hands now there is a way where you can actually synchronize both hands together so that they think about the exact same thing, and that's what we're gonna look at next. There's quite a high probability we'll be joined by the drill from next door in this next section, but we'll soldier on regardless. What I'd like to do now is look at the tapping possibilities that you get when you consider superimposing one sound on another. Okay. Now C minor could be conceived as being C Aeolian. It could also be perceived as being C Dorian. And both of those have really really strong common superimposition the three minor sounds in c aeolian are c minor f minor and g minor the three minor sounds in c dorian are c minor d minor and also g minor so that means i can play both c minor and g minor against c minor sounds and be fairly safe in the knowledge that it's going to work in most situations now this is useful to us for two-handed tapping because it allows us to play C minor or hold down C minor type shapes with one hand whilst outlining G minor shapes with another. In fact, there's no reason why we couldn't flip it around as well and play the G minor with the fretboard hand and C minor with the, uh, the hammered hand. But, but that's another story. We can get to that uh, once we've dealt with the, uh, maybe the most simple thing of thinking the actual key we're in with the fretboard hand was tracing out a perfect fifth above with the, uh, the tapping hand. Okay, so let's just do this with the E form. We'll just do this with the E form and I'm gonna leave it to you to figure it out with all the other shapes. And we'll do it as an exercise and then you can figure out some licks. So I'm gonna trace C minor, pentatonic with this hand. And then with the tapping hand. And I'm gonna follow it exactly. Like so. Now you have a choice here. You could use separate fingers, like a different finger for each of the tap notes. Or you could just whiz around with one finger. It's up to you. You just gotta be a bit careful about background noise, you know. So just be a little bit careful, be light with the mute. It's a kind of a, a tricky thing to mute. You've got to be careful that you don't over uh, that you don't over mute and end up making noise with the mute. That's kind of like defeats the purpose of, of the mute. Rather than than having like having to resort to tying stuff around the headstock if you can help it. The beauty of not having to do that, of course, is means you can incorporate open strings and harmonics and all of those other cool things that work great with those kind of rock techniques. So just to recap, the idea here is is that the fretboard hand is traced in C minor. <laughs> Whilst at the same time, 
The tap in hand is tracing out G minor. So I'll do this with maybe. That kind of a rhythmic idea. Or whatever pattern. Whatever kind of patterns you can so think of. Sometimes, you know, I like to use just one finger. Sometimes they're split amongst two fingers. You could maybe hammer on both notes. It's all cool. Let me do this one more time. I'll do a really slow pattern for you. I'm just going to do a pattern of hammer, tap, pull. Hammer, tap, pull. A la Greg Howe. Let me get that first note cleaner. Opposite way. and you can create your own variations there I'm sure okay so just to re uh, recap we have two options here we have the straight line approach or not you know as it, as it, it uh, moves out on the B string or we have the superimposing As always, I hope you got something from the material we looked at this week, and I hope that you enjoyed the performance. I certainly enjoyed doing the performance, playing with the great Andrew McKinney and Elliot Henshaw. Don't forget, any questions, suggestions, or requests are gratefully appreciated and considered. Um, likes and shares are always appreciated as well. So please feel free to get in touch. Hope you have a great week, and I'll see you next week for week number 49.